Welcome to Seller Pass TV. We're live in the Red Room at Raymond Vineyards, and today we have Deloche Vineyards and the wonderful Brian Maloney. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, tell me a little bit about Deloche. This is not an Apa Valley winery. So no. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll make that clear. <laughs> yeah, we're on the other side of the hill. We're over in the Russian River Valley in Sonoma County. We're actually one of the first wineries that was founded there back in 1975. Um, helped actually draw the Appalachian boundary, so one of the pioneers in the area, and uh, specialized in Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Zinfandel, um, three varieties that grow great in the area. Absolutely. Uh, so how long have you been working there? I've been there since 2003, so I'm coming up on my 11th harvest. Oh my goodness, you are a lifer. Uh, not quite, but getting <laughs> closer Almost. every year. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so where, uh, do you live in Napa Valley, Sonoma? I live in Calistoga, so top end of the Napa Valley, you know, right where the valley bends towards Sonoma, so it's a, it's a nice place to be, kind of straddles both locations. Exactly. What, uh, what did you do before you got into the wine industry? Well, I grew up actually on a, uh, a, a local ranch out um, towards the Sonoma coast, and uh, grew up raising lamb and she uh, sheep and cattle and things like that and went to high school. Um, so came from the area, grew up in agriculture, and uh, went to UC Davis, got a degree in viticulture and enology, and uh, happened to get my first crush job really at Deloche. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's not so bad. So what was your favorite um, animal that you raised? Was it the sheep? I um, actually love dairy cows. They have lots of personality. Um, just, you know, they're, they're nice animals. Uh, sheep are dumb. I don't know what sheep else to tell <laughs> Yeah, but cows have a good personality to them, and, you know, you get to know them. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And what was the name of your favorite cow? Um, her name was Kayla, actually. Kayla. Yeah. I so like it. <laughs> all my cows had K names. I, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Kayla, just, yeah. Katie, Candace. Carla, yeah. Carla. <laughs> yeah. There's several different ones. That is very cool. Yeah. Uh, so we are starting with the Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about this particular wine. Well, we have two really fun wines today because they're actually kind of preview wines for us. We're not releasing them until this weekend for the mm. solstice. Uh, they're, the first is the Estate Chardonnay. And this is from the vineyard right around the winery that when I started working at Deloche, um, we replanted actually a, a year and a half after I'd started working there. The vineyard had been in the ground for about 30 years, had gone into decline, and needed to be reborn, so to speak. And so um, we reached back to some things that John Charles Boisset brought to California, which is biodynamics, like he learned in Burgundy, right. and implemented that on our own estate. And the 2011 is actually the first vintage where the vineyard's now at maturity, and we were able to harvest all the blocks. So. This is a very special It is. Wine. It's kind of, a, you know, a, a rebirth, so to it's, speak. It's the baby. Yeah, it, it is. truly is. It's yeah. the baby of the property. That's incredible. Well, shall we? Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Mm. I love how this wine's showing right now. We actually just did some tasting notes on it the other day. And uh, it just shows, you know, some of those more richer flavor characteristics you get off of Russian River Chardonnay, mm -hmm. as well as having really nice acidity and uh, kind of complex layered aromatics. I mean, there's kind of some honeysuckle to it, um, some more riper apple characteristics, and then just really pretty spice. It is very nice, and um, you know, for traditional Chardonnay, I, I definitely like it. Yeah. I'm not always a fan of the Chard, but uh, this one actually is not bad. It's something I would actually pour in my glass well, when I'm you. not sitting here. <laughs> 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 Says a lot. So it is 100% barrel fermented, which is you know a very you know traditional Burgundian technique, California technique for right. that matter, and it does go all the way through the malolactic ferment. But because of where we're located in the cool Russian River Valley, it still has a nice vibrancy to it, and I think that's one of the reasons why Russian River Chardonnays you know tend to shine maybe a little bit more than Napa Chardonnays. Yeah, you're probably right about that. I know, um, and it's a great region for these wines that you're saying. It's like uh, that region is just built. Yeah. For, for these three particular ones. But tell me a little bit about um, the biodynamic growing practices. I know, uh, you know since uh, John Charles took over the property, that, I mean, this is, you know, you've completely redone yeah. how the property, how you guys grow, exactly. your gardens, everything. And the whole layout and everything. Really, biodynamics, um, it, so it, it traces back to the 1920s and a gentleman named Rudolf Steiner, who was a philosopher. And basically, he looked at, you know, how, how things were growing and how best to integrate, you know, these systems so they'd last for a long time. Um, and he came about because of a reaction against the first chemical agriculture that was going on. People using salt-based fertilizers and seeing their vineyards, not necessarily their vineyards, but their farms going into decline fairly quickly. They get these great robust yields and then year after year just to own the decline. And then the sterility of the ground and everything exactly. else that goes along with it. Exactly. And so Steiner really didn't understand all the different elements that were going on, but he knew that we had disrupted the system, Something so to speak. Something wasn't right. <laughs> and so biodynamics looks back at how do we correct that system. And really what it comes down to with biodynamics is having 
healthy soil that your plants and your animals are living with and interacting with. Soil, we, you know, we walk on it, we don't pay a lot of attention to it. Biodynamics is investing that time and energy into making sure your soil profile is a living system, that you have the right bugs in it. And that means you do have to abandon things like those salt sprays, fertilizers, right. those chemical sprays that are going to wipe out the really intricate, complex soil web of organisms that are helping with you know, protect your plants, but also feed your plants. Exactly. And so we use things like compost. Uh, we use teas that we develop from um, botanicals that we grow on the property itself. Uh, we use some of the compost inoculates that uh, Steiner developed back in the 1920s in order to provide healthy organisms that are going to, you know, break down the nutrients that are in the soil and also things that are on the plant and protect them. Um, it's actually, a, it's really interesting because a lot of it is feeding into kind of a more modern way of looking at our lifestyles and making right. sure that, you know, we're getting all those complex nutrients that we're going going out and looking for organic produce. We're looking for the, you know, the harder way to get our nutrients because it's better for us in the long run. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, as a society, we're definitely getting uh, more aware of where our food's coming from. You know, the organic movement's yep. huge. And it, it's not a fad. It's, we're starting to realize, uh-oh. It's you a lifestyle. Know, it's yeah, a lifestyle. It has to be a lifestyle. It has to be something you commit yourselves to. And, right. Um, it's, and it's good for you. But you, yeah. um, touching back on something you said a moment ago, you, you had me at tea. Uh, so we're brewing tea for the, the soil? Yeah, we actually, um, well, tea for the soil, tea for the plant. So we actually have very large um, drums, for lack of a better word. Uh, it starts with uh, different uh, plants that we grow within the vineyard itself. We have a block set aside for growing different things like chamomile, um, valerian, things like that. And then you take these, and in some cases you dry them, and you um, grind them down essentially into a, a fine powder, mm -hmm. and then you mix it into water, and then you broadcast either over the plants or in some cases onto the compost pile itself. Um, it really depends on which preparation you're looking at and what your goals are. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. I think we should have a tea party in the vineyards. Yeah, uh, it gets a little smelly. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with the valerian. Yeah. <laughs> you should see some of the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Uh, well, it's very exciting what yeah. you guys are doing there for sure. I got to visit last month and uh, just absolutely enjoyed the property. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful spot. We're right in the Russian River, middle of the Russian River Valley, so um, we're surrounded by vineyards. You look to the south and you can see the Petaluma Gap and its fog blanket. You look to the east and you can see Sonoma Mountain and Taylor Peak and all those different kind of oh, you know yeah. eastern boundaries. And then you look to the north and you can actually see the edges of the redwoods. We're really not that far away from where that whole redwood empire starts. No, you're not. You're very very close, and you, can, you know get the nice cooling trends of the coast breezes and everything it's really nice I'm very seasonal and uh, everything I do from uh, foods to visiting and I know like uh, the Russian River Valley like my favorite favorite time of year to visit like late August yeah. to like um, September and then in like February it's yeah. just because all the fog and the, just the well, and especially, I mean, in early spring, we can get some beautiful days where, I mean, it's just crystal clear and blue skies, and it's it's a pretty special place. It truly um, is. But, yeah, August is probably our, you know, our most popular time for people to visit. The weather is always beautiful. Um, the get vineyards cool are full of their fruit. The and then and yeah, breaks away to amazing sunshine. And then it comes back in at night, and so it's just this nice cycle. you got to remind people, bring your sweatshirts. Exactly. But, um, people don't remember. They're like, what? Yeah. I'm like, no, no, layer. <laughs> yeah, layer is exactly right. Yeah. Lots and lots of layers. Well, oh, very cool. So what would you say your favorite aspect of uh, the winemaking process is? Well, really it's being able to live the cycle. Winemaking is not a, uh, it's not a job that, you know, every day you're doing the same thing. You're, you're watching things develop and grow and change, and every year is different. And, you know, writing that cycle is, my, it's my favorite part of the job. You're not doing one thing, you're doing everything. You're going in and, you know, right now we're making up blends, we're racking wines, starting to bottle. But at the same time, we're looking at the vineyards. And so it's that complex, you know, interrelated cycle that we're part of that is really what makes it exciting to me. It's knowing that tomorrow is a different day and there's a different aspect that I'm looking forward to. And you're building up towards, you know, beautiful bottles of wine that we get to share at the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah. You have... We do have some comments finally coming in. Yay, team bloggers. I want to say a shout out to Cellar Mistress and In a Fabulous World and, of course, My Vine Spot. Thank you all three for joining us today. And Cellar Mistress is saying, wow, great acidity on this estate Chardonnay. Citrus, apple, nutty, hit, nutty hint on the finish. Very nice. And uh, In a Fabulous World also is loving the hint of apple. Uh, I, th I think that's a nice touch in there because yeah. you don't often get it, you know, in a Chardonnay. Sometimes it's like masked with other yeah, I, you know, other oak, notes. oak and Chardonnay are, you know, those are kind of the two watchwords for people sometimes. And this is, you know, it's all aged in barrel, but we like to do a barrel fermentation so that that wood element gets integrated into the wine as opposed to kind of, you know, layered on top. And right. um, that's our goal with our wines is to make sure all those components kind of sing together instead of just being like wood. Yeah, <laughs> or butter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, those two things. Yeah. <laughs> this is fabulous. 
so are you using biodynamic practices or are these full up biodynamically grown and certified? So we are Demeter certified on our estate vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, so we have been since 2009 and uh, yep, that's, so it's biodynamic practices, but it's the certification the as certification. well. Um, as far as the winemaking goes, we're not Demeter certified at this point, um, but it's something that we are looking into. And um, as we upgrade our facilities, something we're hopefully going to be able to pursue in a, a concrete manner. Oh, very, very cool. Yeah. We're excited to see how that goes. Yeah. Uh, so when you're not making wine, yes. <laughs> What, what are your favorite hobbies? What do you love about wine country? Um, well, I, I love the weather. I love being able to go from, you know, the beach, you know, where it's 65 degrees right now or probably even a little bit cooler and, you know, see that fog rolling in um, to going into the hills and, you know, being up at an elevation and being able to look over the valleys. I mean, just living here, the change in geography and what you can do in an afternoon is pretty amazing. And we are pretty lucky. Yeah. And what's, your fa what's your favorite hobby? Um, I love to garden and cook. Uh, you know, I'm one of those <laughs> people who, you know, love food and wine and the experience of getting out in nature and um, it's, you know, it's different when you're cooking in your own kitchen instead right. of working in the winery or um, working in your own garden instead of working in the vineyards. But there's a lot of those elements that, you know, play out, um, paying attention to the cycles, um, paying attention to how flavors layer and things like that. Yeah. So those are my two passions. I read a lot. Um, you what know, I'm getting... book you read? Oh, I actually, the book I'm reading right now is by Jared Diamond and it's uh, called The World of yesterday, I believe. Anyways, it's about native societies and just different elements of how those civilizations evolved. Um, he's a, he actually spoke to um, the Green Valley, which is an organiza uh, a sub-appellation and an organization we belong to. He actually spoke at the Earthquake Earth Day celebration that they did. So I got his new book and just, uh, it's a fascinating read. It's a little long, a little dry in some places, but I mean, just, you know, looking at how different cultures have treated things like, you know, old people or, you know, the environment and how right. that's changed over time or situations. It's, it's something I enjoy. That's very cool. Yeah. It's kind of exciting. Um, my vine spots coming back with baked apple, pear, sweet toasted oak, brown spice and caramel, and a nice texture to boot. Thank you very much. That's very nice. Good feedback. Cheers. Very nice. All right. Sipping on to contestant number two. Yep. We have... So this is the, the partner wine, so to speak. All right. I'll let you do the honors. This is the Estate Pinot Noir. And this is grown right next to the Chardonnay, right all around the winery itself. Um, we replanted this at the same time as the Chardonnay. And uh, its first year of production was in 2010, just like the Chardonnay, but it was just a little amount off that young vines. And this year, 2011, was the first year where all of the blocks reached maturity and made their way into the blend. Oh, it smells incredible. Yeah. So I am a huge Pinot fan. Yeah. Pinot, Pinot is that, it's that grape where, you know, you try and describe why you like it and you end up losing yourself for words trying to figure out what you're talking about because it's so, I, it's almost emotional in a way when you put it in your mouth. Oh, it truly is. It is a beautiful, beautiful wine. And this one is tasting very nice. We just... Uh, Spent a week up in Tahoe and enjoyed a bottle of Delish while we were up there. Oh, excellent. Among 15 others. But <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good weekend. It was a good week. Yeah, yeah, it was a good week. <laughs> so what was kind of fun about this wine was in 2011 was a very cold vintage. It was cold all throughout the year. Um, but it was also a very small crop year. And so while there wasn't a lot of heat out there, there was enough heat for the plant to redirect that energy into the clusters. And actually, we got some really pretty ripe flavor characteristics. So, yeah, you, know, you didn't have a lot, but what you got was really good. Exactly. And we were able to do a whole cluster portion for this. So about a third of the blend in this was done um, full whole cluster. I mean, just, you know, you put all the clusters into the vat itself, and then we did traditional foot treading. So, you know, you get in there, wear your shorts, take off your boots, you no know, climb way. right in. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Me and my assistant winemaker and a couple guys on the team all got a chance to do foot treading on this, a very <laughs> traditional fashion. Um, and that's how the fermentation went. I am going to have to send a bottle of this to my sister because she is all about the foot crushing and yeah. everything. Oh, they just don't do that anymore. But this particular well, only, bottle. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something when we see that good, you know, ripe stem development happening, it's, it's something we embrace. We're very big believers that how you treat your ferment um, is a big part of what the resulting wine is like. And the gentlest thing you can do, I know this is going to sound strange, but it's actually climbing in there with your bare feet. It's a lot gentler than, you know, going in there with a big punch down device or spraying the wine or something like that. So. That's incredible. I yeah. love it. Absolutely love it. 
And so this vineyard is located on the Dolores this is, property? Yep, right if you there. come and visit us at the winery, this is the vineyard that you come through. Um, the Pinot Noir is on both sides of the driveway as you drive up, as well as in back. And then the Chardonnay is directly across from where our uh, barrel room and crush pad is. So it's all, if you come and visit, you can see everything. It's all right there. It is a beautiful property. Uh, you can uh, book your experiences at SolarPass.com or visit their website and book right there through our widget. Uh, they have amazing experiences uh, to be enjoyed there and uh, definitely a property I would not miss if you're going to be in the uh, Russian River area for sure. It is incredible. It is definitely one of my well, favorites. Thank you. And, um, and you were saying you know, the property, you know, that, that particular region is so close to the coast and, uh, you know, you're obviously the valleys and yeah. everything else. but. Um, I, you know, there's so many different little areas of the, uh, the Sonoma Coast. What's, yeah. your, like, what's your favorite beach? Um, so I've always been a fan of kind of the southern Sonoma Coast right around. Uh, you have Dillon's Beach, which is actually over in Marin, but then mm -hmm. you also have Salmon Creek up there. Um, Doran Beach is a fun beach to go out to. I kind of like those dunes. Um, it's, that's, that's the area I like. I know a lot of people like a little bit further north where it's rockier, but I like the big dunes and the sand but and yeah, everything. I, um, I, I washed about a mile down shore just trying to surf at Salmon Creek once. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can do this. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I think finally came back up. Luckily, I was smart enough just to grab the board and go with it. There you go. <laughs> the board will float. The board will float. <laughs> Good times. I, I am digging this Pinot Noir. I am very happy with it for sure. Yeah, there's some really pretty, um, the whole cluster is what's singing to me right now, and you're getting some of those blueberry fruits, some of the herbal elements you get from whole cluster. Um, on the palate, it's still a little tight. I think that's going to flesh out that's as it gets baby. a little bit more time. Absolutely. Yeah, baby. no, exactly. Baby wine it right is. Now. Uh, What's the price point? Price you, point. You're asking the wrong person. Mike, um, what's the price point to be I going to be? I think it's 35 and 50, but I'm not positive. All right, coming, coming back to that, we will get back to you with price points. Winemakers and price points. <laughs> don't ask. I just make the stuff. I don't, yeah. I don't sell it. Uh, so speaking of passions of food mm -hmm. uh, and gardening, what, what would you pair with this particular wine? Oh, this particular wine I think would actually do, um, that's a good question. To me right now, it really, and maybe this is because it's summer, but I'm thinking of, you know, just kind of like a little tomato sauce. I know that seems weird for a Pinot Noir, but, you know, tomatoes right now just, you know, right now I'm seeing the first ripe tomatoes come into the markets, and this to me just has that kind of brightness that would go with maybe not like a tomato salad, but, you know, um, maybe just uh, even like grilled whole tomatoes, you know, Ooh, something like that where you're getting, yeah, would be good. yeah, something like that with uh, a little bit of olive oil on it, um, or even just like a fresh pasta where you're making one of those fresh tomato sauces and just quick dice and quick saute. A um, little bit of basil, a little bit of garlic, and this would be Way beautiful with that. It's definitely a lighter Pinot Noir. I don't think this is going to stand up to you know, you know, a big hanger steak or something like no, that. No, I was thinking sauce. almost like a um, citrus marinated grilled chicken. That would be perfect with it. Yeah, or really, you know, tiny little lamb chops. You know, where it's just really subtle flavor to it. Um, veal with like you know a veal something boca or something like that. Maybe if you want a little bit more exciting flavors, this would hold up with that. It's I think summer we don't need exciting flavors. <laughs> What's the case production on these? Um, the Chardonnay we made a hundred cases, and the Pinot Noir we made five hundred cases. Fifty bucks for the Pinot. Yep. Wow, thirty-five for the Chardonnay, fifty for the Pinot, and we'll tell you about the Zinfandel shortly. <laughs> I'll give you some good feedback here. A beautiful round mouth feel wrapped around a firm spine of acid with a nice lingering finish, and that's coming in from my fine spot. Uh, also had a question, uh, well, we already got the pricing. I uh, noticed the Chardonnay is really limited production at only 99 cases. Mm -hmm. That's, that's it's tiny. Four, it's four barrels, yep. So this was the, like I said, um, second year of production. First year of production, we did 45 cases, I think, 48. Okay. Um, it's, it's only an so acre and a half block. Yeah. yeah. Um, so once it reads to its full maturity, our goal is to have about 250 cases coming off of it, but it's always going to be a, a smaller, smaller yeah, smaller production wine. Crazy. Uh, Cellar Mistress is saying the P this Pinot Noir brings back memories of uh, her Russian River Valley visit up at the Olivet Wine Road. So, yeah, that's yeah. All, hey, well, all right there. Right off all it's, of that. It, so it is. Absolutely. we got some great wineries up and down that road as well, so it's a fun place to come and visit. Oh, absolutely. And uh, Cellar Mistress is very happy right now, loving this Pinot Noir. So we'll linger on this a little longer. I'd love to hear your feedback. What are you guys pairing uh, this wine with tonight? I uh, always love to hear your feedback. And... Uh, Definitely getting some other chime-ins coming in here quickly. 
Uh, one thing I love about Pinot Noir, it's not something you necessarily have to pair with food. Mm -hmm. and I think that's one thing that um, makes it such a versatile wine because this could just easily be sipped fireside, maybe roast some s'mores and yeah. um, just watch the sunset and let, let the evening progress. It is definitely a, um, an easy drinking wine. Uh, so what's going on in the vineyards right now? So right now we're essentially done with flowering at all of our sites and um, we're in a point where the berries themselves are starting to swell and so uh, two different things are happening. One is in the vineyards that are a little bit further behind, we're in a point where it's called berry cell division, which means that you're getting all the potential cells in that berry that's ever going to develop. And then as vineyards progress, they go into berry cell expansion. Um, what we're trying to do right now is go in and leaf and expose those clusters right now, get that sunlight on them before they've gotten too big, before you get to bunch closure, um, so that we get good healthy cluster development. We want to get all those mold spores killed. We want the wind to come through and wash out the vines. It's a, it's a very natural way of doing it. You let the sunlight and the wind do the sanitation for you. So it's a lot of hand work right now. Um, we should be starting to see color change this year. We're about three weeks ahead um, as we were than last year. So, you know, honestly, uh, 4th of July, 14th of July, that time period, we're going to start seeing some red grapes out there. That's incredible. Yeah. So it possibly could be an earlier harvest. It's, you know, if the summer holds to the what we've seen so far, um, it will definitely be an earlier harvest. We'll be picking in August, I have a feeling, for at least some of the warmer sites for Pinot and Chardonnay. Oh, that'll be nice for a lot of people who have been harvesting well into Thanksgiving. Yeah. In the last couple of years. It, you know, I think a lot of us are looking forward to actually working on Labor Day this year. Exactly. <laughs> you know what? I would love to have my holidays back. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so our mistress is uh, coming back with ripe, velvety, huge cherry flavor. She's in love. That's amazing. And my vine spa appreciates the 13.5% alcohol. Um, and I think that's you know definitely something that's worth comment. There's so yeah. many um, wines are getting into super high alcohol contents, and uh, frankly, as a consumer, I don't get it. <laughs> I'm sure there's reasons for these mm -hmm. things, but uh, it's nice when you know you're not like, oh wow, I can you know have a 17 point wine. Yeah. Ah. Well, I, I mean, I think a lot of the alcohol level you're seeing um, has to do with the 2011 vintage, and just uh, when you have winemakers who are you know, making the wine from the year as opposed to making it to a formula, you, you're going to see variations in, right. you know, where the sugar level is. And in 2011, you know, we, we were happy to get 22 bricks of fruit. We were happy to get 22 and a half, 23. So, um, you know, we had great flavors at those points and they made very pretty wines. But yeah, we're, we're down in the 13s uh, almost on everything except for Zinfandel. Well, that's, and that's normal. Yep. So to speak, nor Zinfandel's usually a little bigger. Yep, that is for sure. Loving the blend and the earthiness and the berries coming from Anna Fabulous World. Cheers. And I know we are getting ready to skip along here to the always fabulous Zinfandel OFS. Excellent. So this particular <laughs> baby, where is this one coming from? So this is a blend of three vineyards. This is the OFS Zinfandel, which stands for our finest selection. Sure it does. Officially. <laughs> um, some of you have known Deloche for a while. You might be able to share what it originally stood for. Not even on the web. Not even on the web? <laughs> ah. um, so Out freaking standing. Something along those lines. Uh, something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so three different vineyards. The, the base of it's actually a young vine vineyard we work with off a of west side road called the Becknell Vineyard. Planted in early 1990s, but just tremendous hillside site. Really, really good fruit. Um, the other two are two older vine vineyards. One, the uh, Allegria Vineyard, which is up towards Healdsburg, and it's uh, planted 1890s, and it's a mix of all those different varieties. Zinfandel is about 76% of the vineyard, and the rest of it is, you know, everything from Petit Syrah and Alicante to Trousseau and Bastardo and, you know, all the rest of them. I think Bill Nackbauer has like 17 different varieties he's documented in this oh, wow. block, so pretty cool stuff. Um, and then the final vineyard's another old vine, Zinfandel Vineyard, just around the corner from Deloche called the Biscetti Vineyard. And that's another planting from the early 1900s. Almost all Zinfandel, though, with just a little bit of petite. Every time I hear that vineyard, I always think of spaghetti vineyard. Yeah, well, it makes you think that way. <laughs> You're like, no, no, not spaghetti. I'm like, well, it sounded like it. <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean, it's a mix of young and old. Um, our finest selection, it's a barrel selection. We go through, we taste through all our lots. Um, me and Katie, my assistant winemaker, uh, have... Just finished actually the OFS Chardonnay about two weeks ago um, for the 2012, and uh, we're starting on the Pinot. Zinfandel, we, we wait towards the end because it's usually a later wine for us to bottle, so we don't usually bottle this until around January of the year following harvest, or two years following harvest. Oh, okay. Anyways, yeah, so it yeah, so sits it's, around for a little while. Yeah, it sits around for a little bit. Um, and so this will get selected out right before we start picking grapes this year, and we'll make the blend, go back down to barrel, let it sit, bottle it up, 
It's yeah. tasty stuff. See it in a couple years. Yep. Uh, a seller mistress was saying uh, regarding the Pinot Noir that she was pairing it with her grilled Mediterranean pine nut crusted salmon. That sounds awesome. That does sound awesome. Yeah. I, I, I concur. I, I like this idea. Um, all right, so we're just going to wait for some more comments coming back through here in a second. I, um, this Zinfandel has actually been a fan favorite of mine for a very long time, and uh, it's definitely still holding up great consistency. Yeah. Definitely looking forward to how you know it'll change and develop a little bit over the next year or so. But so far, so good. First sip, not bad at all. Yeah. Um, but of course, you know, being a winemaker, and they're all your babies, which one is maybe one of your more preferred children in the lineup? Um, I have to say, actually, the Chardonnay is probably right now my favorite in, of these three. And I love all three of these wines, but that Chardonnay, the, the estate, just because it's a... It's a block that is literally very close to where I work on a day-to-day -day basis, so I see it every day. Um, it's one where we had some struggles early on with it. Uh, it was hit really badly by frost damage in 2008. Um, we had to regraft and you know grow it back up the wire, so to speak. So seeing the quality that we're getting out of that block now is it's really satisfying to see that happen, see all that time and that effort come to fruition. So. Um, that's more of just a sentimental attachment I have, right. but um, Zinfandel's always been my favorite grape to work with um, from just, you know, the hedonistic, pleasurable part of it. It tastes good out in the vineyard. It tastes good when you're fermenting. It tastes good when you press it. It's just, it's just good. It's good. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's hard not to have a smile on your face when you're drinking Zin. So, um, yeah, I love Zinfandel. And, uh, yeah, Zinfandel's so good. And I, I have to say, though, for a while, I mean, Zinfandel used to be, like, the go-to wine for years uh, for me, and then... I don't know, there was something that just kind of shifted mm -hmm. in the in definitely the California Zinfandels um, to the point that I migrated over to Pinot Noir for, yeah. well, until about now, but uh, definitely starting to, you know, get those characteristics that always attracted me I, to the Zin. I think part of it is people were really chasing a ripe and riper flavor profile with Zin, and Zin will get really ripe. And oh, so yeah. you could get to the point where you're picking fruit out, you know, in the Sierra Foothills or, you know, Lodi area, and you're bringing it in at 30 bricks. You can do the same thing in parts of Sonoma. Right, and then you get, like, this blackberry jam exactly. you know, glass, which is great, but it's just not... But it's kind of hard to taste, you know, drink a whole bottle of that. Right. Um, and in the Russian <laughs> you River... Try, right? yeah, you try, toast. <laughs> you know, we tried it on pancakes. It doesn't work, actually. It's just <laughs> it's not really quite the right match. Hard to um, <laughs> but uh, Russian River Zin, though, has uh, just a beautiful acidity that's natural to it. It's probably one of the coolest appellations that still ripens Zinfandel regularly. And so even though we still have really ripe fruit, I think this is 15% or 15 and a half. Which is not bad. Uh, it still has that nice acidity, though, that right. keeps it nice and clean. And so you can go back and have that next sip. Um, and I think uh, a lot of people who fell in love with Zinfandel fell in love with those kind of either lower alcohol wines coming out of the Sierra Foothills or from, you know, Russian River Zins. Right. Um, and, you know, we've been kind of doing the same style year after year. and Keeping it consistent. Yeah, it looks like people are kind of trending back to where we were. That's, that's good. It's a very good sign. Uh, my Vine Spot has a question re going back actually to Pinot, no Pinot Noir. He'd mm -hmm. love to hear what you think about native, uh, what native yeast adds to the Pinot Noir versus cultured. Sure. Um, so we use native yeast as much as possible in our winery um, across everything. But um, for the estate, of course, that's even more important since we are trying to file the biodynamic tenants in the winery as well as out in the vineyard. Um, I, I really feel the best part about native yeast is that you get multiple organisms kind of doing a little part, and each one does it a little differently. And so in a, like our location, we have a yeast, a wild yeast out in the vineyard called Klekra, which creates a little bit of a smoky compound, but then it dies off after about 2%. And after that, it's taken over by small populations because we're not dumping, you know, two pounds per thousand gallons of yeast into these vats. We're talking about, you know, there's microscopic amounts of native yeast from the flora that lives in our winery itself starting the fermentation. And when they do that, they have to create all the yeast themselves from, you know, as, as they grow. Um, and they're doing that out of the components of the wine. And so you end up with a wine that, you know, it's a little bit slower to start its fermentation. And so you get a little bit longer cold soak. They're making a whole wide range of compounds. They're making glycerols, all sorts of different aromatic alcohols. Um, it just becomes more complex. And so I think with native yeast and native ferments, you get that kind of, you know, better mouthfeel out of it. You get more complex aromatics out of it. And ultimately, usually a better wine. Um, there's a risk with them, though. Um, and that's, that's the other half of it is if you have fruit that comes in, like in a year like 2011, where there was problems out in the vineyard with rot and things like that, even the best selection, when you put it over a sorting table, you can't always clean that out. And so yeah. um, if you have bad organisms like Botrytis and Pinot Noir, for example, you're going to want to intervene. And, you know, we do that if we have to, but our goal, our goal is always to do native yeast. That, that's incredible. Uh, in Fabulous World was saying she was pairing her Pinot Noir with grilled chicken and goat cheese salad. You know, actually, I had that for lunch today, but not with Pinot Noir, so maybe I should have waited. <laughs> Very good. 
And uh, my fine spot is commenting on uh, this particular wine, the round mouth feel wrapped around a firm spot. Yep, yep, yep. We already talked about that. That was the other one. Uh, this, what would you be pairing with the Symphondel? I mean, this to me is like short ribs. I mean, you can go a little bit beefier and heavier. Tri tip would be awesome with this. Um, just, you know, literally cut off a hunk of French bread. Not just much more than keep that. It simple. Yeah. Simplicity. Um, I mean, you could do more with this wine. You can, you know, it's got some nice acidity to it, so I mean, you could go some more complicated dishes. Um, I think even, I think Zinfandel and Pinot Noir flavor-wise actually have a lot of kind of like Zinfandel takes over where Pinot Noir stops, if that right. makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of the same spectrum of flavors that work with both varieties. So, I, you know, you could work with lamb, you could work with beef. Um, be a little bit harder with the fish, but you know, you got like a chipino or something like that. Something this would that's be, got a bold flavor. Yeah, you got that bold flavor. It. It'd work fine. That would definitely work for sure. Uh, I, you know, I, I, you know, call me classic, but I definitely, you know, love the barbecue yeah. with the Zinfandel. It's like, yes, please, let, let's roll with that. I could see this with a really, um, really deep, long summered barbecue sauce on yeah. just about anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it would be good. Just throw it on the bread. <laughs> yeah. Um, you go up to Buster's in Calistoga and you get some of his barbecue, this would be all right. Yeah, it wouldn't be bad at all. And it's not, not that is good stuff. You gotta steer clear of that sauce though, man. They, his spi if you get the spicy, it's, it's spicy. Yeah, they don't, they're yeah. not messing around. No. That's like too spicy. It's yeah. like, I'll take a drop <laughs> and put that in the other Maybe one. Maybe cut it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just a dropper of that. There we go. It We're polishes all set. your silver really well. <laughs> <laughs> it does polish your silver really well. Cellar Mistress is saying, great zen, very juicy, elegant, not overpowering uh, with the burn I love. Needs barbecue for sure. Absolutely. Nice. And uh, Cellar Mistress is moving to Napa Valley, so she will become a local here very soon. We're very excited very about cool. that. Going to have to come and visit us. Oh, I'm sure I'm sure you're here on our list. <laughs> I have no doubt. So we're, we're super excited. She's been in Iowa forever, and now she gets to finally live her dream. So we're excited to welcome her to the fabulous world of wine on a daily basis. And, uh, well, really, we're, uh, do we have any special events, Mike, that we need to talk about that we should tell people? We have a great weekend event coming up right Ooh. now. Oh. So we're having our summer solstice party, which is the release of the estate wines, but we're also going to have um, our culinary team putting together different things for coming out of our garden and such. Um, Eric Pooler, who's uh, in charge of our viticulture program, is going to be teaching people about biodynamics at the winery. And so this is all on, is it Saturday, Mike? Sunday. Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. So solstice actually starts tomorrow night, but a couple days later, we're going to have our, our solstice party. And uh, yeah, come out to the winery. It's going to be a fun time. Um, See, I knew there was something cool going on at Deloche. That's why I put you yeah. in our solstice email. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're going to do good stuff. So it's a beautiful spot. We'll be back at the guest house, which is uh, a fabulous location. Oh, it is beautiful. And uh, you'll be right next to the biodynamic gardens, uh, the organically grown chickens and the sheep and all that food and stuff, and right in the middle of the vineyards. Uh, that sounds sounds really exciting. Yeah. Well, we thank you so much for being here today. Thank this you, Sarah. has been wonderful. So cheers. Cheers. Mm. And cheers to everyone who joined in today. All of our bloggers, we love you, and we couldn't do this without you. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the wines as much as we did, and we look forward to seeing you again. I believe we're skipping next week as we will be traveling to Santa Barbara and visiting a whole new wine country, but we will be back again definitely on, what was it, the 17th? I think we're back on July 17th after the holiday, after everything is done and over, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Cheers. Cheers.